ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, logging on tonight for our Let's Talk Bass Fishing webinar with Pradco, Pradco Outdoors. Goodness gracious. Uh, my name is Kendra Engel, and I'm with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. I'm an educator at the River Valley Nature Center in Fort Smith, and we have several nature centers that offer free programs to the public that are funded by license sales and one-eighth cent conservation sales tax. So if you've not been to any of the nature centers, uh, for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, get on the AGFC website and find us. There are several nature centers around the state. Tonight, we have Dustin and Ethan from Pradco Outdoors joining us and Vic with Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Just a little bit of housekeeping real quick. We are recording this program and then we'll email everyone that signed up a copy of tonight's link as well as the previous week. So this is a five-week series. This is night four, and uh, we will send you tonight's link and the other three um, nights as well if you miss those. This is a Zoom webinar, so those of you that are watching, you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. So if you're chilling in your PJs, that's totally okay. Uh, we're going to be using the chat box for communication, so if everybody would right now, go ahead and type in the chat box and tell us your favorite spot to go fishing. And um, let's, let's get our fingers warmed up that way. If you're new to Zoom, the chat button is on the bottom of your screen. And I will let um, Vic introduce himself and then Dustin and Ethan, I'll let you guys get started. Thanks, Kendra. My name is Vic Desenzo. I'm the Black Bass Program Coordinator with Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Just essentially a statewide position to uh, help coordinate and lead some of the research with black bass and, and black bass, we classify those as spotted bass, largemouth bass, and smallmouth bass. Thanks, Kendra. Yes. Thanks, Kendra. There you go. There we go. It says, it says I was muted accidentally. Uh, my name's Dustin Elder. I work for Bradco Outdoor Brands. Uh, my t title technically is pro staff manager. I work really closely with all of our pro staff members. And then I work with uh, Mr. Chad Warner, our product director, who's the guy that was, he's right here. We're actually, <laughs> we're actually in Springfield, Missouri right now at the Bass Pro and we're working the World Fishing Fair at the moment. We have a booth set up, we're selling product and talking to different consumers. If you're around, you know, anywhere close where you can get to this this weekend, I highly recommend it. There's some really great deals. Uh, but other than that, we're gonna be talking about spawn time fishing techniques, finesse fishing techniques, that is. And I'll, I'll leave to Ethan to introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. So uh, my name is Ethan Butler. Uh, I am a, a regional sales uh, specialist for Practical Outdoor Brands. Uh, so what I get to do is essentially talk about fishing tackle with the people who sell our baits, like uh, some some stores like Mills Fleet Farm and then Shields, uh, some of those bigger stores up north. So. Um, it's a lot of fun. I'm kind of a fishing tackle junkie. I love just, just talking uh, not only fishing tackle techniques, but the actual gear itself. So um, that's, that's, that's what I do for Pratco. Awesome. Well, guys, let's just hop into it. If you have any questions, please just put them in the chat box and then we'll stop and we'll, we'll really analyze those and talk about them as much as possible. But our, our main topic today is spawn time bass fishing using finesse fishing lures. And uh, finesse fishing, basically, that is... Uh, using techniques with light line, uh, light reels and rods, typically a spinning rod is what I you know, typically say. It's uh, using baits that do not make a big presence in the water. That's things like uh, this Yum Dinger, my favorite lure that I talk about every single week. It's using it in a lot of different ways. Uh, that's finesse fishing to me. I'll, I'll let Ethan handle it in a minute. So they'll talk about that. Uh, but just first of all, I'd like to talk to you, Vic, about what, what is the bass spawn and what does that actually mean? Yeah, Dustin. So the spawn is is the reproductive phase for uh, black bass, <clears throat> and one misconception is people think that the, the spawn is this week or the spawn was last week. Well, spawn actually occurs over about a six day week period when conditions are right for different sizes and uh, fish. So typically in Arkansas, you're looking at say you know late March to or mid May. Uh, that's the spawning season. So um, Whenever you're out there, 
uh, fishing, you're going to be fishing for pre-spawn bass, spawning bass, and post-spawn bass, probably, because they're all going through different phases. And uh, so the, the, um, the males will guard the nest. They can be really aggressive that time of year, protecting the nest. But, and, and Dustin and, and, and Ethan, tell me, are, are, is, the big, is the big bass fight still happening? Uh, if, if you get lucky, I mean, that's why I really want to talk about finesse fishing this week is because you can get more lucky using finesse lures like a like this yum dinger and some things that Ethan will talk about in a minute than you can typically power fishing in the state of Arkansas. Ethan, you know, he, he lived in Arkansas for several years before moving back to Iowa where he's from. And oftentimes when we were fishing, we're going to run into him with using something really light presentation like this yum dinger. But yeah, right now you can still run into some big ones. Yep, about as heavy of a weight I'll use during the spawn is an eighth of an ounce just because, uh, for one, like you said, Dustin, water entry or entry to the water is so important with uh, not only being subtle, but just not spooking those fish. And anybody who has not only fished for spawning fish, but seen spawning fish up shallow knows just how easily those fish uh, are sensitive to their surroundings. And, um, you know, they'll always come back to their bed, but it's so important when you make that first presentation to that fish to uh, uh, to essentially kind of sneak up on them and and, and not uh, seem so intimidating. Um, so eighth of an ounce is, is about as heavy of a jig head as I'll use uh, in terms of just finesse baits and, and something like a yum dinger or any version of the dinger. You know, we, we've got the thumping dinger. Um, we've got uh, the, the swimming dinger. Uh, just several, several different stick baits for that that situation. Some great notes, Ethan. And to dive further into just the spawn, you know, talking about this is when bass, they're mating, you know, they're setting up beds, getting shallow. Uh, this can be anywhere from 10 foot deep to all the way up on the bank. So this is the time of year that, you know, if you're fishing, this is when you want to fish. This is when you're going to run into the most amount of fish because they're all moving to the bank. They're moving up shallow. I mean, they're, they're either on their way to do it or they're moving off and they're a lot easier to target. And with some of these finesse lures that we're going to talk about later, it's just a really easy way to, to catch a lot of fish it's not it's not obtrusive it's not hard we'll explain you know down to the finer details of how to get exactly what you need to be able to catch fish in these ways uh but we can just go ahead and just dive right into that uh what i'm going to talk about is the yum dinger that's what i have with me right now it's this is a five inch stick bait lure we talk about it every single week and every single podcast that we have i'll, I'll somehow bring this lure up but that's just because it, it just catches fish i mean it's just a really great little bait and what it is, it's just a, a small stick bait. It just looks like a little cigar. And you can rig it tons of different ways to fish it finesse, like we're calling it. Fish it on a spinning rod with light line and a, sm a small spinning reel, which, you know, pretty much everybody has access to that. And it's very easy to cast with it. The way I like to fish it most is wacky rig, which we talked about before. It's where you take a small hook and you just rig it right in the middle. Cast that bait out towards the bank next to any piece of cover you might see on the bank whether it be grass, rock, wood, anything laying on the bank, you just let that thing sink. You let it flutter down. It's just an excellent way to cover water and get a lot of bites. I mean, you can fish it out to 10 foot deep, pull it back in, throw it back out. It's, it's just a really great way, whether in a pond, creek, river, any system, you can catch them on this bait, wacky rigging, as well as Texas rigging, which is, you know, rigging it with a wide gap hook and rigging it on top and sticking it back through. This is the lure that I, I prize the most this time of year. You can throw it, gosh, just anywhere. You can throw this bait in the, the very slight action that it has. It will catch fish. It will get bites. This is the definition of finesse fishing to me is using a yum dinger, a spinning rod, light line. And that's what I'm going to pick up this time of year. I'm going to have two spinning rods on the deck. They're going to have this, and then they're going to have a variation of it, just like Ethan talked about, uh, with a small jig head with a yum thumping dinger or a yum swimming dinger, which is basically this bait with a swimming tail or a kicking tail. But I'll, I'll get it over to Ethan, and I'll let him talk about his favorites, finesse lures. Yep, and you're you hit the nail right on the head with the yum dinger. That's my that's my A team right there. That's that's what I'm going down the banks with in the spring, and um, generally with that spinning rod. One thing I like about that is uh, not only you can use a lot lighter line on that, and when when you talk about the word finesse, you know that essentially you're you're meaning that it's 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 very incognito right you want the lightest possible line um, possibly the the smallest hook just any of these smaller 
uh, smaller things that fish could possibly pick up on that, that don't seem natural, right? Um, so th those are a few things that, uh, that cross my mind. And with that spinning rod, you know, when fish are spawning up on the bank, you really want to make sure you're making accurate casts. And I can, it's just so much easier with that spinning rod to, you know, maybe skip that dinger up under a dock um, or pass the lay down than you can with, with a bait caster. So um, in terms of the light line, uh, finesse style, you, you definitely want to go with that spinning rod. And, and you do so much target casting uh, in the spring with the spawn. When you're either, maybe you're trying to get that bait past the bed and hit that right, 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 right across the bed when you're bringing it back. So um, spinning rods, definitely what I would recommend gear wise, if, if you're trying to get on some uh, fish in the spawn. For sure. And uh, just another thing to go into with finesse fishing is it doesn't have to just be a clear water fishing technique. You know, we always think yeah. fishing really clear water, like Lake Washita, Bull Shoals, somewhere like that. That's what you want to be doing is finesse fishing there. Well, it also works on like the Arkansas River, like Millwood, you know, lower wide oak, these lakes that have a lot of stain to them. You can still do this. Uh, I mean, I look to a finesse lure in the spawn anytime that you, you have conditions you don't really want to fish in. If it's high, bright, sunny skies, no wind, things like that, you want to use finesse lures like a yum dinger, a swimming dinger, a thumping dinger, which, you know, on a shaky head. You want to use things like that in those situations. So it applies everywhere in the state of Arkansas. I mean, I don't care where you're at. This is something I, I feel you should always start with. You should always pick up a finesse lure like a yum dinger, wacky rig, or a shaky head with a finesse worm, a, a yum thumping dinger. It's just something you need to start with. You need to get out there and you need to start combing the banks, fishing slowly. If you notice, you know, you can get bit on other things, you can move into it. But this is just a good way to find fish and get bites easily. Yep. And, you know, one thing that uh, – Another aspect of this whole thing, you can have all the different types of models and stuff of the dingers that, that are on your deck that you can possibly think of. But uh, when it comes to the actual color of the baits, it seems like the rules for what color we throw in certain situations just go out the window. I mean, yeah, there's there's June bug right there. So each each fish is different, right? When you're casting at a bit or at, at a fish up on a bed. You know, some fish, you might be able to get them to bite on that first cast and other fish, you might sit there for an hour or two hours and you're just driving yourself crazy, figuring out how in the world can I get this fish to bite? And so it's also the time of year where I not only have uh, different models of the dinger, where you've got the regular dinger, the swimming dinger, the thumping dinger, but you've also got several different colors um, available to you. So you might have like a pearl white, you might have a very natural color like green pumpkin. Um, you might have some type of a chartreuse or a pink tip, you know, just anything um, that you might be able to change up, any variable that you can change, especially if you're on one of those fish that is just not, they just, there's something off about your presentation, you know, that's when it's nice where you can just start going through your colors and any sort of little variable that you can change to, uh, um, maybe be the, the key to get that fish to bite. Very true. And, uh, Vic, I was just thinking of a question I really wanted to ask you, and that is uh, as far as, you know, spawning bass goes, where are the typical areas where they're going to go up shallow like we're talking about and actually make their beds? I know I hear people say, well, sand, everything like this and that. Where, what are some typical areas that bass are going to try to spawn in? Great, <clears throat> Great question, Dustin. So, Look, they're, they're generalists when it comes to habitat. So they don't have to have a particular habitat feature. One of the most common uh, places that they'll spawn is on stumps. Um, it's hard to, it's hard. If you were diving or snorkeling, it'd be hard to find a, a stump in April that didn't have a school of fry on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of substrate, um, something that they, they'll be able to fan out. So not big rocks or small gravel, uh, to uh, not quite sand size, but a little bit larger than that. Something they can, that the, uh, the eggs aren't going to suffocate in there. It's mm -hmm. good oxygen airflow as we're fanning it. Um, the hat, I know Jeff told this a couple weeks ago. Uh, Jeff works in hot springs at the, uh, you know, at the hatchery. And when they're spawning bass, they'll put welcome mats in the pond and they'll spawn <laughs> on that. So they really don't need anything but just some little slight difference to, uh, okay. to yep. sort of build that nest. 
Yeah. Vic, this is something I've always wanted to know. So you talked about the window of the spawn being any time from March to mid-May. Now that that's that's two and a half months, right? That's such a long period for the water temperature to be changing. Do you find that those fish in early March, those early spawners, are they in different areas than those fish that you'll be finding in mid-May when the late spawners come up? Or are they generally spawning in the same same areas and just going on the same beds? I think one of the, it, it, it all varies so much in, in fishery science. But one thing that you can almost count on is the larger fish will spawn first um, and, and, you know, get the prime spots. Um, if you're thinking about the early phases of the spawn, you need to think about those areas that warm up faster. You know, thinking about, you know, the, the way the sunlight hits the lake on maybe south banks and things like that. Uh, not too deep, so that water is going to warm a lot quicker. Uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, riparian cover uh, protecting the water, so it's getting sunlight. Um, those areas will, will warm up quicker. Um, and then, you know, kind of longitudinally on a reservoir, you start thinking like upper end to lower end as you progress through the season. But they're going to, if the fish are ready and they're in their home range, That's they're going to. Vic, a great point you made there. Uh, is talking about uh, the different, you know, they need something a little bit different. I like that with the welcome mat example, talking about they, they're going to find something that's just a slight bit different. And that's a, a point I want to make to everyone is whenever you're out fishing during the spawn, you know, always, always cast to places that have something slightly different. I mean, if you're on a bank and there's a rock change, if you're on sand and you see rocks, you see pebble rock change to chunk rock, this is where you want to be fishing. This is where they're going to set up, just as Vic explained. Uh, if you see a log laying in the water where there's not a lot of logs, if you see a little bit of grass, shore grass or deep grass, if you see something something slightly different, that's where you need to be. That's probably where they're going to be set up this time of year. And the perfect place to employ one of these, you know, finesse fishing lures like we're talking about here, like a yum dinger or a shaky head or a, a light Texas rig with something like a dinger or a, a yum Christy craw, a craw pattern lure, anything of that nature. Uh, another thing to jump into, I want to, because we got Ethan on here. Ethan, he's a tackle junkie. He's always thinking about rods and reels and all the different stuff that he wants to get. We talk about it every day just about through texting. Ethan, explain the spinning rod setup that you need to have from line, rod, everything, so people know exactly what they need to get if they're questioning it. Yep, and, you know, again, it all kind of boils down to personal preference, so you don't have to take this down to an absolute T. But uh, just from my personal experience, um, with my spinning setup, um, you know, you can go just get about any sort of spinning rod or excuse me, spinning reel um, where I like to get uh, tricky is with the rod. So um, I want something that's got enough backbone to where when I'm setting the hook, especially on some of those earlier pre-spawn, I shouldn't say pre-spawn, but early spawn, bigger fish, you know, you're going to want something that's got a little bit of backbone where you can drive that hook into them. Um, so I'm looking at like a seven one. Uh, medium to medium heavy uh, rod there and in terms of line uh, you'll want I, I, I like having braid on there one uh, just as a backing anyway for a, a, a main a main part of the line but I like having braid because you can really drive that hook into those fish uh, whenever you pull up and set the hook into them because that's got no um, no stretch, right? Versus something like, I know fluorocarbon's got just a little bit of stretch, but not much. And then monofilament has got the most stretch. So when you're fishing with a, a soft plastic like that, you want something like braid um, as your main line to where you can really drive that hook into that fish's mouth. And I, I go with a white color braid um, for my main line. And then I'll tie that to uh, about an eight pound to a 12 pound fluorocarbon later. Generally, I stick with eight pound because we are talking uh, about the finesse side of things. So the lighter, the better, essentially. Um, but I'll go with about a two foot long, uh, eight foot fluorocarbon, uh, not eight foot, two foot, eight pound fluorocarbon later. Um, and then I like that white color braid because braid, um, not only does it have no stretch, but it also sits on top of the water and it'll float. And so once you cast that dinger up shallow around whatever a stump or a log, especially if you're talking about maybe your water is not so clear and you can't actually see those beds and you can't see that fish take that dinger, 
um, you'll be able to see that braid on top of the water take off and, and having a contrasting color like white. Um, that, it just makes it a lot easier to where you're not kind of squinting and taking guesses if, if they've actually got the bait or not. So that's, that's my setup in a nutshell. Dustin, I assume you've got something similar tied on. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. I just wanted to get, you know, your, your input on that. Uh, as far as the braid goes, I highly, highly recommend braid. If you're throwing something like this wacky rig dinger or a shaky head with a small finesse worm, because oftentimes during the spawn, you know, you're casting out and you're working it real slow. Well, these fish, if you're going to cross by their bed, they'll come up and they'll pick that bait up and they'll try to run off with it. They're just trying to move it out of their bed. So oftentimes they're not actually swallowing it. They're just moving it out. And you won't even know it because, I mean, they'll just pick it up and run with it because they're very fast, yeah. as we all know, very fast. But, man, I mean, they'll they'll pick that thing up. And if you see that braid laying on top of the water, you can easily see that thing. <laughs> and, man, you can set the hook, drive it into them, you get them every single time. So I yeah. highly recommend doing that. It's really great. And we got a question on here talking about braid to a fluorocarbon leader. That's that's a must because, I mean, you got it. Some people, they can just throw straight braid if you're fishing really dirty water. That's not a big deal, but fishing somewhere with clear water with the visibility is over, you know, over six inches. Gets you, like Ethan was saying, eight to 12 pound fluorocarbon. Just gets you, you know, whatever brand you want to choose, pull you off two or three foot of it and then tie yourself a good knot on there, the time together. Uh, you can go on YouTube and you can look up, uh, I mean, they've got all sorts of braid to fluorocarbon knots. I use one's called a Red Phillips knot. It's a really easy one. I recommend that if you're looking on YouTube, but tie yourself a good knot. Tie yourself a little hook on there, tie yourself a little wacky hook, a Texas rig, you know, EWG hook or a small shaky head. You're ready to go, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it can be tempting because, you, you know, you'll see you'll go in stores and you'll look at your line section and you'll see, oh, man, you know, that, that monofilament, that's so cheap. That's I got to go with that. But if you can, then just try. I know it's a little more expensive, but just try and get that braid. And if you really, really want to make a difference, you know, tie that four carbon leader on there. And I promise you, it, it'll make a world of a difference for you this spring. It sure will, especially with something you're wanting to sink very slowly, like this, this young dinger wacky rig. Yep. I mean, fluorocarbon, it sinks. So it's going to pull that bait down a little bit. If you're using monofilament, it's just going to sit there and hover. It's not really going to do anything. If you're using straight braid, it's not going to move at all. You want that bait to fall and kind of just shimmy in the water. And that's what you get with fluorocarbon. So, I mean, it, like Ethan was saying, it just it just helps. It makes a lot of sense there. Uh, but as far, far as just a rod and reel combo, I mean, I just look for a seven foot medium, just like he was saying, with a strong backbone, and just a just a decent little spinning reel with some braid and floor carbon. And man, you're ready to go. Yep, absolutely. Do we have any more questions from anybody wanting to know anything? I don't believe so at the moment. Uh, okay. Just wanted to just pull out here, just everybody that's watching. Uh, what is your favorite finesse fishing lure for this time of year? If you can comment on their favorite, whatever it might be, whatever yep. color it might be. I'm you know, curious. I would, I would just, I would, yeah, I would love to know what yeah. everyone is going to be using. Everybody's like got always, a color. Yeah. Like always, highly recommend fishing this time of year. It's the best time to ever fish if you're going to go out bass fishing. Texas rig. Well, yeah, that's very hard to beat. Mm -hmm. Just a light Texas rig, flipping and pitching around stumps, grass, anything like that. Texas rig and wacky rig. I mean, you can't go wrong with one of those. And yep. Texas rig can be very finesse as well. I mean, you can use a very light weight, like Ethan was talking about, an eighth-ounce weight, a small, <clears throat> like a Christy Craw or something, just flip it around. Now, a cool thing about that Texas rig is if you just rest that on the bottom of their bed, um, if you've got a blank plastic on there, then that, that bait will rise up right in front of their face and uh, – you know, just that's that's a great way that you can just trigger those fish like that. They see it kind of rise up and um, anything that looks threatening to their bed, they'll, they'll be on it. I saw someone said a, a curly tail minnow. That's an excellent option this time of year. The same as a, like a small swim bait. That's a great option on a, like a really light, like an eight ounce jig head, just casting a small swim bait out and reeling it around mm -hmm. where, you, where they might be bedding. Very great option. Yep. There was a couple other questions I wasn't able to see pop up. Justin, somebody Shot. asked about that knot. <laughs> oh, yeah. about tying the knot. Yeah, it's called a Red Phillips knot, and you can you can Google it, and it'll come up. Lots of different videos of people that do 
really well of explaining it. That's a that's a great knot. Yep, there's there's so many of those uh, braid to fluoro knots. I use what's called the double uni knot. So um, it, it really just you can go down so many rabbit holes. I learn on YouTube, and you know there's there's just so many good tutorials out there um, for for tying knots. Any other questions pop up? Drop shot with a minnow. That's about as finesse as it gets right there. Yeah, and drop shot work great too. I mean, me and Ethan, mm-hmm. we throw those a lot. That's a really great option. Just cast it out, you know, three sixteens quarter ounce weight with a small finesse worm on it, and just drag it down the bank. Just pull it down the bank with that spinning rod. You'll run over their beds. You'll run over fish that are just cruising this time of year. Yep. Really great option there. <laughs> Fake bait is best compared to live bait for bass. Well, I mean, live bait is always a great option for any any fish that eats. Yeah. It's always great. But, uh, I mean, I just really like using artificial lures because it puts a little bit more a challenge to it. Yeah. Plus, we're tackle junkies, so it's, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's a little bit of – something to buy when you're at the store. Yeah, we're a little biased. Mm-hmm. But, no, I, I mean, I, I think live bait will always be king. But Oh, I'm, yeah. I think, you know. That's this is quite a part of the reason why we love this industry so much. It's just it's as much as we love catching fish, we love talking talking tackle. For sure. What was the last question that popped up? What would you throw? What color would you throw in Beaver Lake? Beaver Lake, uh, natural. Yeah, very natural. Very very clear water. Yep. Uh, something like this uh, green pumpkin with a sharp yep. spruce tip, yum dinger. Anything green, green pumpkiny. Yeah, Gilly color. Suit's a good one. Uh, Elder's suit. Magic. Elder's yep. Magic. Do you put anything on your soft artificials? Uh, sometimes put scent on there. I mean, e- Ethan C knows. Uh, one thing that we like to do is we take all these yum dingers, we get them in these 30 pack bags, which are a great option. Take them, put them in a big, uh, like a glad bag. I put about 60 or 90 of them in there. Then I spray them with our yum scent spray a ton of it in there then i put a bunch more salt on top of it it makes me feel like i get more bites i don't know i probably don't but i enjoy it <laughs> like you're doing something important anyway but i mean yeah. you know something like adding uh adding that that flavor I, I like to think it's flavor or extra flavor you know add more sugar to the lollipop or something like that but yeah um you know you're talking about fish just picking stuff up and moving it off their bed and swimming off well you know, maybe, maybe once they get that in their mouth and they taste that salt and they think it's blood, I mean, that, you know, anything to give you an edge. Mm-hmm. What is the best hook choice for soft plastics? And then I think we have a question for Vic. Ethan, I'll, I'll let you handle that one. Best hook choice for soft plastics. Man, that, that's, that's, that's a, uh, you can go down a lot of different avenues um, for what we're talking about um, with the wacky rig. They make certain wacky rig hooks um, for uh, for the dingers. And so um, it's just kind of like a circle gap hook. I, I like about a four-odd or three-odd hook. Um, that's a pretty good, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big enough to where if you do hook into a big one, you don't have to worry about it bending out, not having enough, uh, enough, essentially backbone in the hook. And I'm also small enough to where you're, you're not um, over presenting that bait. So um, I'd say between just the uh, wacky rig hooks, um, you know, the EWG gap hooks for Texas rigging, I think those are some of the most popular ones out there. Um, you can go down so many different avenues with this. So, I mean, they make flipping hooks for if you want to really get into, you know, fishing some of the thicker stuff um, in the spring, if you have to get into a bunch of vegetation. Um, but generally, I stick with those EWG, about a, a four-odd or a three-odd um, if I'm Texas rigging um, or about a, a, a three-odd for wacky rig hooks. Anything to add on that, Justin? I definitely agree on that. I mean, just get yourself a plethora of good extra wide gap hooks from two to four out, just like Ethan said, and you pretty much be ready to go. Right on. Uh, we had have a couple questions now. Um, the next one is for Vic about bass in the White River. Actually, it might be for uh, it might be for Dustin. Uh, I haven't. Okay. I've only been in Arkansas for a little over a year. There are bass in the White River. Um, trout need water temperatures less than seventy degrees. So 
I'm not sure where on the white that transition happens from cool water, from cold water trout fisheries to warm water bass fisheries. Um, but I think that was Cindy. Um, if you can get me your, uh, put your a way to contact, um, way to contact you, I'll, I'll find out for sure and get back to you. Uh, basically, from my experience in the White River, uh, anywhere that it dumps out of Bull Shoals Lake, Beaver Lake, and connects to Norfolk, any of that stretch, there there isn't bass there. It's way too cold. But in the, the White River lakes, like Bull Shoals, Norfolk, Beaver, Table Rock, tons of bass. So I guess it's just got to be in the actual impoundment, the lake impoundment. Uh, the next question is, what is the best bait for, like, nine-year-old kids that are just starting fishing they're going to be fishing off a bank with the Zebco 33. This right here, five-inch yum dinger. Gets you a 30-pack of these in a, in a color that matches the water you're fishing. Gets you some extra wide gap hooks like Ethan was talking about, Texas rig it or wacky rig it. There, there's no wrong way to fish this bait. You just throw it out and let it sink. Yep, I think that's a great option. Um, you know, if, if you're taking kids – it's, it's one thing to try and teach them to get bites, but it's also another to try and teach them how to set the hook. So that's just another variable that I, I try and take out of it for those entry level, entry level kiddos. So, um, you know, anything you can do to keep that hook open and out there to where anytime they get a bite, all they got to do is just put pressure and reel on it. That's, that's just one little trick that helps fish stay on there. And, um, that's a great one. And then if you're also fishing from the bank, I mean, just, you know, a, a lipless bait like a cotton cordell. Um, oh, oh uh, it used to be the rattling spots, but um, cotton cordell. Yep. Yeah. Super spots, the, the lipless baits, um, something like that, or a, a booyah one knocker, a hard knocker, you know, that's just something great where you can just tell them to cast and start reeling back. And so sometimes if you just keep them engaged and active like that with the reeling, you know, and then that's got the exposed hooks. So once those fish bite, man, they're on there and they can just reel it in. So those are probably my two go, go to baits there. Okay. And then it's just a lot of questions about like what part of the lake, what part of the river. And I think you guys have kind of talked about that, you know, in the shallow and the bedding areas and all of that. Um, but I think we're caught up on questions. If, if I didn't answer your, ask your question, answer it again, because I may have skipped some. As far as where to look on lakes, I saw one about Greer's Ferry or any lake in Arkansas right now, or river. I mean, pick you out pockets, coves, anywhere that has lay down timber, shallow water, shallow water adjacent to deep water. And uh, that's just good places to start. Shallow water that has deep water nearby. You know, if you got shallow points, coves, pockets, anything like that near a river channel, that's that's money. Yep. Yeah, they, 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 the fish are real sensitive to water temperature this early in the year. And so anytime we get a cold front like this, you know, they'll they'll they'll, they'll want that access to go back out deep and, and be in that, that stable water temperature if they want to. But they also, if it warms back up, then they can just, they don't have to go too far, come back up shallow. Okay, um, a question about Alabama rigs. What do you throw in lakes, and what are the ideal temperatures for bass fishing? As far as Alabama rigs, uh, that's not really a finesse technique. And during during the spawn, it, that's something that really it's the only time of year that it doesn't really apply because bass are typically so shallow. But it's something good to keep you know just keep on the deck of your boat or keep next to you if you're you know walking around a bank because. I mean, you can always encounter a situation where you might be around deep water and you might be faced with some post-spawn bass, bass moving back off the bank, and that's a good time to have that Alabama rig ready. But during the immediate spawn, I mean, I typically just like to have a spinning rod with some yum dingers and things like that to fish with and just kind of leave the, the bigger, faster stuff, and just leave it in the box. <laughs> yep, I agree. I've always kind of considered that Alabama rig. Um, that's a great – early pre-spawn technique, you know, in, in January and February um, when those water temperatures are still in the low 40s and creeping up to 50. Um, that's, that's, that's what I've always categorized that as. I've never really um, thought of it as much of a spawn bait, but um, yeah. And then what are ideal water temperatures for bass fishing? Gosh, it seems like 
anything <laughs> around 60 degrees is the best. Cause, I mean, just yeah. like Vic has explained many times the past few weeks, that's that's when bass are getting up to spawn. So, I mean, if you see it around 60 degrees, that's it. That's money. I'd say 60 to 70, that's, that's the best, in my opinion. Yep, I think that's definitely when the bass are going to be the most active. Um, the way I look at it, the warmer that water temperature gets uh, throughout the year until it reaches a threshold. When it gets up to, you know, upper 70s and 80s, then they do start to slow down a little bit. So that sweet spot seems to be about 60 to 75 degrees. And it's, it's just like all of a sudden the fish have drank, you know, Red Bull and coffee and they're just swimming all over the place. And um, it's, it's definitely the most fun fishing you'll have all year. It's just like, you know, with people, you know, when it's 60 to 70 degrees, you know, that's when everybody's typically the happiest in the spring or fall, you know, it's just, it's nice. You can just wear a short sleeve shirt and some shorts and it feels nice. It's the same with the bass. It feels good. And that's when they want to move the most. Um, do salt impregnated soft baits have advantages? They certainly do. I mean, like yum, everything we make at yum is, is salt impregnated. we got salt pushed into it. I mean, not only does it give a flavor to whenever the bass actually bite, but it actually makes the lures have more weight to them, so they sink better. And when a lure sinks better, it has more action on the fall. And then how does the water temperature compare to air temp? Like, how, how can you have an idea if the water temp is going to be 60 to 70, depending on air temp? Like, how do you judge that? Well, it's a pretty tough question. Yeah, I mean, you can always just do the easy test and kind of stick your finger in the water. And um, uh, I always rely on my, my depth finder or my graph uh, to tell me that. So um, I suppose if you don't have one of those, you know, you, uh, that's, that's what I would do is just kind of stick a finger in the water. And, you know, if, if it's freezing cold, then I would you know, probably say it's in the 40s and 50s. And once you kind of start sticking your fingers in the water and it kind of feels more like room temperature, um, I think that's that's when you're really getting in that good water temperature range of, of 60 to 70 degrees. Any think, any better way to explain that? I mean, that's, that's kind of the approach I would take to that, Dustin. I, I was thinking that she was wondering what the, how would you know what the temperature is if you don't live on the water, if you're not already fishing? Oh, if you want to gauge the temperature to discern if you can, if you want to go fishing. And I think there's probably enough fishing forecasts and message boards out there where people are <laughs> constantly posting what the water temperatures are. Cindy, do we, yeah. do we get to your answer there? <laughs> Give her a second. <laughs> yeah. I think I think David's got us a joke here. Do released <laughs> fish spook the others in a farm pond and turn the bite off? No, nah, not definitely not in the farm pond. I mean, they once you catch one, I mean, they'll run back down. But I don't believe they're doing any talking to one another. I think it still it still stays pretty good. Yep, I would agree. I would agree with that. And you, and you can find the fishing forecast. You can find them online anywhere. You just Google Greer's Ferry Fishing Lake Report or Lake Washtaw Fishing Report. There'll be lots of people that have a full in-depth report. Hey, they're biting this. Hey, it's water temps this. Really good stuff. Mm -hmm. So RJ said, um, you mentioned the green pumpkin for Beaver Lake or clear water. What other combinations would work in that situation? And what is the name of the yum flavor that you added with the salt? Uh, as far as the yum flavor that goes, uh, we have a couple of different ones. We have a yum shad scent, a garlic scent. The garlic is the one I would pick for use on soft plastics. That's just, it's the best smell and it kind of, it, it covers up all the other smells. I mean, our hands and everything have smell. So when you put that garlic on there, I mean, it takes it away and bass seem to really like it. Uh, as far as other lures to use at beaver, uh, I recommend anything natural. Just like Eden said, a bait fish color, whether it's a gray or a white, something that, looks like a bait fish or a crawdad that's you want to be as natural as you possibly can get it i mean that's whether it's a yum dinger that's in pearl silver flake like ethan talked about or a swim bait and just a shad profile yeah depending on what part of the country you're in too you know i know you get to uh like arkansas and you've got a lot of uh, red dirt clay down there um sometimes just trying to match the color of your bait with the bottom that's that's a great way to 
um, to appear natural to those fish because a lot of times the forage in that area, well, that's eventually that's what they'll kind of molt into, especially those crawfish. They're trying to camouflage themselves from those fish. So um, the closer you can match whatever color the bottom of the bait is, that's, that's a great way to, to give a natural appearance. Um, do bigger baits catch bigger fish? They sure do. I mean, they definitely do. They attract the bigger fish because they're going to be able to eat that to eat that bait. But little fish aren't really scared of it either. You'll just typically get less bites than you will using a smaller lure. So mm -hmm. I don't normally go that route. I like to catch as many fish as possible. Yeah, I like to stay in the middle. <laughs> um, the best color for murky or the best bait for murky water. And then what uh, bait on Norfolk? I mean, the best bait, I mean, I'm still, for this time of year, I'm going to say a yum dinger just in a darker color. This is June bug or black mm -hmm. and blue or black, something with a dark color because it's going to have a better silhouette in that murky water. That, that's what I recommend. You just need to use darker colors. Yep. Yeah, dark colors, that's a great, uh, great rule to live by when the, the water is not super clear and um, you're trying to get those fish to see it is uh, like a black and blue flake. That's a great color. Um, June bug. That's another one. Anything that's got a dark base that uh, the fish can see the silhouette or the shadow of that bait from a little further off than they might be able to with uh, a more natural color. So, um, yeah, that's if you're throwing a yum dinger in murky water, that's that's the color I would kind of stick with. And then also something I've found is, is a great murky water bait is a Colorado blade spinner bait. Um, trying to create as much vibration in the water as you can, um, especially in the early spring. Uh, if they can't see your bait, well, those lateral lines on those back, black lines running down their sides, that's what they use to feel vibrations in the water and uh, sort of prox proximize where that bait's at close to them so they don't necessarily have to rely on sight as much as they do. Um, to, to feel stuff around them when the water's dirty and they can't rely on their sight. So something like a Colorado blade or uh, a rattle bait, anything that they could hear or feel, uh, you know, you could use that to your advantage when the water is not super great quality. Um, Cindy has a, has a question about um, choosing bait that's the same color as the bottom um, of the lake or whatever. Um, as to why you would choose a bait that camouflages rather than a bait that stands out? Uh, because everything that they're eating is naturally going to be colored what's around them. I mean, that's the reason that minnows and brim and everything don't just get completely decimated it's because they camouflage a little bit. So you're wanting to look as much like what they're eating. I mean, there wouldn't be many. That's why there's not many just big orange goldfish running around in a clear water lake because, I mean, they can get seen. They're going to get eaten. So you want to have stuff that kind of camouflages. Yeah, it, it kind of sounds backwards. You're, it sounds like you're trying to hide the bait from the fish, but in reality, all you're trying to do is um, those bass are looking for forage that's going to be in the same color as, as what Dustin talked about. It's going to be natural to their surroundings. So um, you just want the fish, whenever they do find your bait, to not have any doubt and say, yep, this is, this is what I'm eating. This looks good, and I'm, I'm going in. Does the sun, um, midday bright sun, turn off fishing? Uh, not, not this time of year, just because the water is going to continuously warm during the day. You know, as the sun goes up, it's going to warm even more, and bass will typically just keep pushing to the bank. So, no, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. And what about fishing with a bright white lure in clear water? Uh, sometimes using a bright lure in a shock color works good during the spawn because, you know, it, it draws fish off of their beds and it can sometimes get you a reaction bite. A lot of people like to use a bright red methylate colored worm or a bright red a fluke style bait this time of year. That works great. Uh, it just really just depends on your lake and your type of bite that's around. I always like to start with natural. And, I mean, if you have to, you can move into that kind of stuff. Yep, that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb I go by. Start as natural as possible. Try and get as close to what they're eating as, as you can. And then if that doesn't work, then all my color rules just go out the window. I like having all kinds of stuff uh, that I can access, whether it's a dark color, a white color, you know, just this time of year. Crazy color. Crazy color, that's right. Vic, is there anything um, you wanted to add to, to this? Or, um, oh, we have we do have one question 
Are you currently fishing point? Are you also fishing point currently during the spawn? Points are good all, all throughout the year because, I mean, that's just a, a gateway for bass to move shallow and deep because, you know, a point is shallow and then it runs a long ways out. So, I mean, it just gives bass a gateway to be able to move up and down different water columns. So, it's always good to fish a point. There's never a bad time to. Recommendations for Maumelle. Lake Maumelle, I mean, I've – I recommend using a wacky rig, either a spinning rod with a wacky rig with something like a green pumpkin. Or, I mean, if the water's murky, if it just rains, something like June bug. I mean, a wacky rig is what they're going to be biting there. It's very similar to, you know, other parts of central Arkansas that I fish. So I recommend that. Yeah, from about April till May, you won't find anything else in, in Dustin's rod locker besides spinning rods and wacky yeah. rig dig. It's, yeah. <laughs> he keeps it pretty simple this time of year. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's used on North Fork? Well, North Fork's a little farther north than uh, where I'm at. I'm in Hot Springs, so uh, it's it, the water temperature's going to be a little bit colder up there. They're still going to be more in a pre-spawn mood there. So things like Ethan talked about, a, a Colorado blade spinner bait or a red lipless crankbait, or uh, maybe even an Alabama rig like a Flash Mob Junior would work right now. All right. Looks like um, is there a best or worst time? of the day for fishing the spawn? Ooh, great question. Great question. I like to wait till a little later in the day, um, just because as the sun comes up, assuming you're fishing on a sunny day, um, I guess that's one thing that you'd, you'd want to look into is if the sun's going to be out and um, there's not a lot of clouds, then I would probably wait until late morning um, to early afternoon uh, if you're wanting to maximize your percentages and trying to catch as many fish as you can in a short amount of period this time. It's not saying you can't catch them in the morning or the evening, uh, but as that water is continuing to warm up in the spawn, um, you know, that, that still is going to be sensitive with the sun. And so um, I, I would say between 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. would be would be about the money time for that. You could probably even go later in the day. And, and if you really want to stay out, you know, four till six o'clock, you could be catching fish. What do you think, Dustin? Or That's good or, points. I mean, yeah. it's definitely this isn't the time of year you got to worry about getting up really early unless, you know, you just really want to. If that's the time you have available. It seems like the, the afternoon, the evenings work typically the best. Yep. We've done a lot of surveys where we actually talk to anglers when they come off the water from fishing. They're called creel surveys. And I think y'all are spot on. I think midday, uh, sun up, warmer, the warmest water of the day is probably going to be your best action during the spawn. Okay. Uh, what kind um, of spinner bait do you want to use at Dardanelle? Uh, Dardanelle, I mean, something with a Colorado blade, whether it's double or single Colorado, just because it moves a lot of water, it puts out a lot of vibration. I mean, this is a Colorado blade. It's just a, a, a small little circle. It pushes a lot of water, you know, something with a bright color because you're fishing dirty water. You know, War Eagle, one of our brands, actually makes a river rat color spinnerbait called Dardanelle Special. So, <laughs> great one. Check that one out. What size are spawns? What was that? What size sure. are the spawns? I'm not quite sure what she means. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about it. Time what yeah. you mean by spawn, please. Uh, spawn is just the time that bass move shallow uh, to begin their reproductive cycle. <laughs> yeah, I would say either that or, you know, it's, it's about two, two and a half months long. I'm not, like you guys said, I don't know if she's meaning how long the spawn is or. Yeah, I think she was thinking how how much time, like oh, okay. how long does it take? Gotcha. Or, yeah. Yeah, I guess for that, that might be a question for Vic. How long does, you know, you say these fish, there's a period of spawn, but say when one fish goes up to a bed, how long does it take that fish and its, uh, it's, it's mate to complete the spawning cycle before they go back out? Yeah, so if you start with, you know, you we've done studies where you catch – baby bass and you can age if you take a bone out of their head you can age by day 
how many days it was to the swim up and how many days it was from swim up to fry. So it's all temperature dependent um, from eggs, from fertilized egg to a uh, swim up fry, you're looking at like five days and then another five to seven days probably until they get to swim up um, and they can start, they absorb that yolk sac and can start swimming on their own. So the whole process is a couple of weeks. Again, temperature dependent. Do you use rubber bands on your wacky worm hooks? Uh, not not typically. No, I don't really like to use a band. I like to just use just a regular hook in the middle of the um dinger. Yeah, I mean, I you know, Dustin and I are, are fortunate. We know the people who make them, so we don't have too much trouble trouble getting them. But uh, it's a great way to save some money and save some uh, some plastics if you are on a budget and. Um, so it's, you know, I would say it takes away from any of the action or the effectiveness of it. So um, if you're looking to save a little bit of cash, that's, that's a great way uh, to, to do it. All right. So if a fish is hooked down deep uh, with a single hook, is it better to cut the line and throw them back or to try to remove it? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> Vic, is there, a, is there any good answer to that? Yeah, I'm there's always not a great good. answer. I, I would cut the hook. I would cut the line. I do yeah. know there is a great video by Wired Fish that, and something I've used several times. You can actually go through the gill and then grab that hook at the bottom part and flip it over, and it'll pop right out. I've, I've done it several times. Wired Fish has a great video to show how to do that. It's just another another option to that. We yeah. I'll oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say we, we had one that's getting the, the questions are piling in now, but uh, Deborah asked when do the fish spawn? That's going to be temperature weather dependent. It's going to be anywhere from 60 degrees at the onset of spawning to mid to late 70 degrees. Uh, so figure April and May it could be a little earlier, could be a little bit later, but for the most part, April and May. Kendra, I'll let you get caught up here. Yeah. Um, how effective is the FF? S sonar for spanking fish. Uh, I, think, I think you mean spawning fish there with forward facing sonar. It actually really, it, it doesn't have much use during the spawn because I mean, you're fishing shallow and you're not really looking at sonar or anything. You're just needing to find shallow cover. So I'd say it, it's not really necessary this time of year. I think, I think we're caught up then. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? This has been great. Does the fishing turn on during the spawn, or is this when they're finicky? Ooh, can go both ways. Certainly, it just depends on the day. I mean, yeah. it's the best time to have a good day, but it doesn't mean you can't have a really bad day out there as well. <laughs> that's the whole point I, of fishing, right? That's right. It's, it's a reason it's called fishing and not catching, but I, it almost just depends on the fish. You know, I mean, there's some fish will run across this time of year where you'll fire up there and you'll get them on the first cast. And then there's others where you'll throw the whole tackle box at them and you'll, you'll think it's, you know, there's no way to catch them. So um, it, I, it just is on a fish by fish basis, but I like um, to be optimistic and say it's a, it's a good time of year. So James is asking, um, they are going to be going out fishing on the Washita this weekend and they are going to start at daybreak. What type of um, lure should they be using at daybreak compared to the warmest part of the day in the afternoon? Uh Early in the morning, I would recommend still at Washita. I mean, they still could be kind of deep in the morning when the water's cold. I recommend something like our Young Flash Mob Junior umbrella rig. Throw something like that around points, uh, staging areas like secondary points and pockets, things of that nature. And then as the sun goes up, I mean, transition to using a, a Yum Dinger, Wacky Rig Green Pumpkin Yum Dinger, and throw that the rest of the day. You want to throw that as the sun's up and it's hot. That's what you should be doing. Okay. All right. It looks like um, we, we can do a few more questions if anybody else has got questions. Um, just a reminder that if you would like to have this um, emailed to you, I'm going to type in Danielle's email address and we will have this recording um, 
sent out to you as well as the recordings of the previous week. So if you want to email Danielle and we will get that to you as soon as we get it uploaded and ready to go. And we will be back next Thursday at 